Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool, this also is vanity. Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. For wisdom is a defence, and money is a defence. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Consider the work of God, for who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? In the day of prosperity be joyful, but in the day of adversity consider, God also hath set the one over against the other, to the end that man should find nothing after him. All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? It is good that thou shouldest take hold of this. Yea, also from this, from this withdraw not thine hand. For he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. Wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Also take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. And that's where we're picking up from, verse 21. Also take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. There's no connection between this verse and the previous one, unless it is a gentle reminder that you are guilty of the same sins that your enemies commit. Romans 2, verse 3. Romans 2, verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Verse 21 says, Also take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. Be careful what you listen to. Ecclesiastes 10.20 says this, Ecclesiastes 10.20, curse not the king, no not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. Here it comes, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. We looked at this a while back, remember? And, it's, and from this um, verse, we have the modern day saying, A little bird told me. Look at it. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. A little bird told me. You've heard something, you pass it on, you gossip, you backbite. You're listening to things that you shouldn't do. Be careful what you listen to, be careful what you speak about and to whom and where. We have a term today, don't we? Eavesdrop, which means secretly listening to a conversation. We eavesdrop. Interesting, isn't it? Therefore, don't backbite. Romans 1.30, you never know who's listening, so don't talk about each other. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Don't backbite. Don't talk of others behind their backs. Be careful what you speak and to whom and to where and be careful what you listen to. 
Yet the day and age that we're living in now is taken up with bugging, everybody's listening to everybody else's conversations, and surveillance. Everybody's watching everybody. Um, over the last few weeks, you'll hear on even the national news that um, people are suing certain papers because they've been eavesdropping, they've been um, tapping into their phones and listening to conversations and therefore reporting about things and it's being put on the internet and the whole thing's gone worldwide. And so people are taking out injunctions and suing one another because of this. People are listening. We've got a listening headquarters, haven't we, down in Cheltenham called GCHQ. Government headquarters for listening. Surveillance and listening. So they'll monitor calls and they'll monitor all kinds of things all around the world saying that it's for our protection but surveillance and bugging is, seems to be the in thing for today everybody's watching everybody CCTV everybody's listening to everybody and it's going on the internet it's going worldwide and it's in seconds that you can pick things up this is the age of bugging and the age of surveillance everybody is watching everybody yet one day everything will be brought to Light. Matthew twelve thirty six. Matthew twelve thirty six says this. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Nothing goes unnoticed with the Lord, everything's recorded. Of course we've had our sins forgiven, but everything will be brought to light one day at the day of judgment. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. A lot to get through, that's why we're pushing forward a little bit tonight. A bit quicker than normal perhaps. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts and then shall every man have praise of God. Every single thing you've said and done, your motives, every single thing about your character, everything will be brought to light one day at the judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.10 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether it be good or bad. Judgment seat of Christ for the Christian or non-Christian? The Christian. The great white throne judgment is for the non-Christian. So it's talking to us there. Revelation 20, Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Look at verse 11. I saw a great white throne. So you've got the judgment seat of Christ, you've got the great white throne judgments. Two different judgments. One for the Christian, one for the believer, and one for the unbeliever. The person that has rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark 4.22 Mark 4 Verse 22 for there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. Every secret will be revealed. One reason to fear God is this. He knows, like you just said at the start, Donna, he knows every single thing about us. He knows your thoughts, what you've had, what you're going to have, what you're thinking now. He knows every single thing about you. He knows why you do things. He knows your motive of doing things, whether it's for your glory or his glory. He knows everything. Everything will get judged. Everything will be laid open and naked before him. And Ecclesiastes 12.14, which we will get there in the end. Ecclesiastes 12.14 For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. It's like reading the end of a book, isn't it? Beforehand. And uh, we know how it's going to finish up there. Uh, with Solomon, but that's a great verse. For God shall bring every work into judgment. All the things that Solomon's done, every single thing that he's experienced, and at the end of the day, with all his experience of life, 
he finishes with a verse that says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. There's going to be a judgment. God's going to judge. Okay, next verse. Romans 2.16. Have we had that one? No. Romans 2.16. Thank you. Romans 2.16 says this. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. He will judge the secrets of men. The secrets of men. Hebrews 4.13. Hebrews 4. 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Very interesting there, following on from verse 12, talking about the word of God, small w, which is the written word of God, carries on saying, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. It's like giving the word of God a personality. We've said this before. And Jesus Christ is also called the Word of God. And we've done that sermon before where we've listed the similarities between the word, capital W, and the word, small w. Proverbs 15, 3. Proverbs 15, verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. He sees everything that's happening, good and bad. What's going on this evening, Friday night, all around the world? He sees it. What's going on in this church? He's reading our hearts, our minds, he knows everything. And he also knows what's going on in the wicked cities, centres, with all the bad stuff that's going on there. He sees everything. And one day it'll all be laid naked and open before him at the judgment. Just two more here. Jeremiah 16, 17. Jeremiah 16, verse... 17. For mine eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. He sees everything. And the last verse, Ezekiel 11. We don't often dip into Ezekiel, but Ezekiel 11, verse 5. Ezekiel 11, verse 5. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said unto me, Speak, thus saith the Lord, thus have ye said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind, listen, every one of them. That's a good verse, isn't it? I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. God knows. So coming back to here, um, to this uh, verse here in Ecclesiastes 7, Ecclesiastes 7.21, also take no heed unto all words that are spoken. Take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. Be careful what you're listening to. He will say, oh, I'd, I'd like to be a fly on the wall. I'd like to listen to that. But they could be speaking about you, and that's probably why you want to listen, but whether it's good or bad, I wonder if you'd be shocked with some of the things that are said about you. I'm sure we would be. So we have to be careful. One, careful what you speak, to whom and where because you never know who's listening and also don't eavesdrop yeah just live a good clean truthful honest life so verse 21 also take no heed unto all words that are spoken lest thou hear thy servant curse thee verse 22 for oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise has cursed others. Your heart, you may have not said it from your mouth, but you have said things in your heart about other people, you thought things about other people. You have also cursed others. For oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. You thought bad things about people and not have ever said it, you know that. So have I. Somebody comes in, somebody you know you meet or you have some dealings with, you've thought things in your heart and your mind about them. It's hard to live a life that's honest, clean and pure. The Lord Jesus Christ never sinned. Not in his thoughts, not in his words, not in his deeds. He never sinned. We battle this flesh day in, day out and oftentimes lose battles with it. James 3.10 James 3 verse 10 says this 
Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. You ought to be pure in your speech. Don't be bitter, you know, don't um, curse one minute and bless the next. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. We do not want to be like that. Be consistent. We'll look at conversation maybe in a, in a verse or two. Thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. Titus 3. Titus 3. Titus 3. Verse 1 to 4. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy hateful and hating one another but after that the kindness and love of God our saviour toward man appeared that's a great four verses so be careful again how you conduct yourselves what you say what you listen to Colossians 4.6 Colossians 4.6 let your speech be always always with grace seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man what kind of conversation we have, you know, when we're dealing with people, not just Christians, but dealing with people in the world. How do we talk to people in the world? Is our speech always with grace, seasoned with salt? Do we answer as we ought to answer as a Christian? Ecclesiastes 10.12 Ecclesiastes 10.12 The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. You know that people just talk for the sake of it. Just spew things out. Fools just cannot stop talking. They just keep talking and talking about nothing. But a wise man, he controls his speech. He says things when he ought to and then he stops. He's a good listener. Often people just interrupt all the time. We get that, don't we? People just want to interrupt all the time. They want to say, they want to put their so-called four pennies on it. They want to give their opinion rather than just sitting and listening. How often we have seen that in our lives when discussing with different people. Colossians 3, verse 16. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Gently admonishing one another. And Ephesians 4, 22 to 27. Ephesians 4, 22 to 27. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbour. Every Christian ought to speak truth. All the time. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. If you do, you're giving place to the devil. So if you have an argument, put it right before you go to bed. Every Christian ought to do it. 1 Peter 1.15 1 Peter 1 1 Peter 1.15 says... But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. 2 Peter 3, 11. 2 Peter 3, 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Man alive, we've got so many verses there that tell us how we ought to be living, how we should speak, how we should conduct ourselves, what kind of person we should be, more like the Lord Jesus Christ. You can tell what somebody's like by the way they speak, in what they speak, the words they speak. 
whether it's sincere, whether it's true, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, the Bible says, speaketh. So for oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise has cursed others. Be careful with what you say. That's verse 22 of Ecclesiastes 7. Ecclesiastes 7.23 all this have I, what? Proved by wisdom. What do we say wisdom was? Wisdom is the right use of knowledge. All this, Solomon says, have I proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. Solomon has proved what he has said by wisdom. He has investigated, he has experimented, and he has arrived at a conclusion. God has allowed Solomon to see things both ways, from a worldly point of view and from a believer in God point of view. He sees things both ways and he's arrived at conclusions by doing this. God has used him and written this book with that dual application oftentimes. All this have I proved by wisdom. I said I will be wise, but it was far from me. Verse 24, this is what I wanted to get down to. This is why I've pushed a little bit tonight. This is interesting. It's all interesting, but this is interesting. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? Now, if you took that word deep and you did a study on that, it'd be incredible. Because deep covers so much. The deep things of God, the deep, the spirit moved upon the face of the deep. Deep has a lot of different meanings in scripture. It'd be a great verse to study. We're not going to study that tonight. But I want to pick on a couple of things. Verse 24 of Ecclesiastes 7 says this. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? That which is so far away or so deep, who can find it out. Do you know the answer to that question? Nobody. Nobody. That which is so far, or so deep, who can find it out? Nobody can. Not humanly speaking. Here is one thing that I picked up on yesterday, and I put a couple of things on, onto the internet just to look at this. No scientist has found out, no matter what they say, what is in the heart of the earth. The word conjecture, C-O-N-J-E-C-T-U-R-E-S, the word conjecture means an opinion or conclusion based on incomplete information as unproven and unproven mathematical, mathematical or scientific theorem. They haven't got enough information, but they make an assumption, correct, an assumption on what they're looking at. They call it conjecture. A scientist conjectures that at the centre of the earth it's a ball of fire. He conjectures that. And you know what has happened, is we have been brought up believing that, because we're taught it at school, in our science lessons, in our physics or chemistry or whatever they teach it in these days. And you automatically just believe that in the centre of the earth is a ball of fire. But no scientific instrument has ever penetrated five miles, I'm told, below the earth's surface. Okay? Just that. We'll take that for a second. Just, we're going to think about this for a second. Five miles below the Earth's surface. No scientific info, um, instrument has gone further down. Right, so let's look at this verse just for a second. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? Five miles down, five miles deep, we just go deep right, so I'm going to give you all a spade in a second it's going to say go out of the church go and get that piece of grass and start digging right, so you have a spade and you start digging 
Now, I don't know whether any of you have do ever dug a hole, but digging a hole is quite hard work. You dig down. I've had to dig out a willow tree root once in our garden, um, going back years now. And uh, I dug a five-foot hole, a five-foot trench around this willow tree. I went mad on it. I actually injured my shoulder at the time because I didn't pace myself. But, that's another story. So I dug this hole, and you dig, and you take out the earth. You dig, and when you put the earth back in, what happens? You've also got some left over. It's just the way it goes, right? I've never understood it, but that's the way it is. You take it out, put it in, but you've always got dirt left over. But it took ages, and it took a lot of effort to dig a five-foot trench, five-foot trench around that thing to get that um, root out. How deep? Well, that was five feet. We're talking about five miles that you can't, um, no scientific equipment has gone down below five miles. So I just started looking at a few things of how deep things are. Now, any ideas how deep the Grand Canyon is and its deepest point? Any idea? Hazard a guess. Nobody dare. Yeah, it's because we're on uh, tape, isn't it? And uh, you, don't want the, you don't want the world to find out how stupid you are. Yeah, I understand. So, okay. The Grand Canyon, at its deepest point of researching this, is one mile. One mile. Of course you were going to say that. Yes, yes. One mile, right? The deepest part of the ocean, which they've never fathomed, you know, they've never gone down this deep, I'm um, told. The deepest part of the ocean. Anybody has a guess? The deepest part. What do you say? <laughs> you're, looking, you're looking for a bit of a bit of a support there. <laughs> you're not getting it. No. Okay. The deepest part of the ocean is 6.8 miles deep. Now you can't imagine digging a hole that deep, right? I've told you digging at five foot around that that willow tree, digging 20 foot. A hundred foot hole with all that earth is unbelievable. A hundred foot deep is incredible. We drive along the motorways a lot of the time and if they're putting a new um, road in that, they have to dig the foundations or if they're um, going through a hillside or something, they have to dig deep. A hundred foot is incredibly deep. You've got a lot of earth to move. You have to have these big earth moving um, carriers and that. Right, okay. So now, John O'Groats to Land's End. Scotland to Cornwall. John O'Groats to Land's End. How many miles? Hazard a guess? Bar of chocolate for the winner? 800. 874 miles. Dion? Donna, get her a Mars bar. 874 miles from Scotland to Cornwall. Okay? Now think about that. The length of the country. Right? As the crow flies will say, you know, it's a straight line. We'll just say that for now. 874 miles. 874 miles, yeah? And now go straight down. 874 miles. The ocean, 6.8 miles. Now go 874 miles. You start getting a little bit of a picture now. That is so deep. Impossible. No, no, we have never ever gone anywhere near that. We'll look how far we'll go in a second. 870 miles deep. How do we know what's down there? How can you find out what is below the surface that deep? You, you know how many miles you have to go to hit the centre of the earth? 3,963 miles. That's just under 4,000 miles. Now you tell me how on earth a scientist can tell you how on earth a scientist can tell you what is in the centre of the earth without conjecture? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? They assume. They teach evolution as a fact. And so everybody is so gullible in the schools, they drink it up, you know, like a sponge with water. And now they're telling you that at the centre of the earth is a ball of fire. I wonder where they get that from. Ever thought about that? In the Old Testament, nobody went to heaven. They went to where? If you believed in God, you went straight when you died, buried with your fathers, yeah, but your soul went somewhere. Your soul went to Abraham's bosom, which is where? Centre of the earth. And the opposite to Abraham's bosom was what? 
Shout it out. Hell. Where was hell? Where is hell? Center of the earth. Ball of fire? Seems a bit coincidental, doesn't it? A bit quinky dinky. <laughs> but yet, that is what the Bible says, where hell is. You're walking on it. You're walking on the earth, straight below your feet, go 4,000 miles, just that you come straight into it. So, we take that spade, we dig, we dig, and we dig. Now, you may have heard this before, <coughs> but I pulled this out, um, or pulled it off the internet. It says this, the deepest hole ever drilled, ever drilled, is the Kola, K-O-L-A, super deep borehole on the Kola Peninsula in northwest corner of Russia, located near Finland. It was drilled for scientific research by the USSR. Like many large research boreholes, it had a number of offshoots from the central branch, and the deepest, deepest was 7.6 miles deep. That's not even 10 miles. That's not even 10 miles. That's the deepest they've ever gone. They haven't even gone 10 miles. You know how far it is, like we said before, that as far from Scotland to Cornwall is 800, is over 800, nearly 900 miles. They haven't even gone 10 miles. They haven't even gone from here, the other side of Bromsgrove. And they're going to tell you what's in Scotland, digging through the ground. That's foolishness, if you believe that. It's impossible. What, how can you measure it? How, what are you going to do? And if you don't know what's down there, they, you know, there could be different layers of rock, obviously. You know, what you say, obviously, but <laughs> we say, is it obvious? But what is down there, how can they prove? Conjecture. They assume, they make assumptions on things and they feed it to you as facts. Now, even though the borehole in question was 7.6 miles deep, it only penetrated a third of the Baltic um, continental crust. The rock at the bottom of the hole was about, here he comes, this is what the internet says, yeah? 2.7 billion years old. And they drink it up just like a fact. Conjecture, assumptions, science fiction. The borehole reached this depth in 1981. The temperature at the depth was 180 degrees, 356 degrees Fahrenheit, at which point the rock became more like a plastic than a solid, which stopped further drilling. The original depth goal was going to be 9.32 miles, but a faster than expected increase in temperature forced a premature halt to the project. If the borehole had extended down to 15 kilometres, the project temperature would have been 300 degrees C, 572 degrees Fahrenheit, well over the maximum operating temperature of the drill bit. They couldn't drill any further, it got too hot. That's what they're saying. Now, a rumour, I'd heard this before, of course, you know, where do you hear this? You, you hear all these kind of rumours where? There's only one place to hear them. The Pentecostal church. Here we go, listen to this. The Kola super deep borehole was the source of a tabloid rumour, started by a Finnish newspaper that Russian researchers had burrowed through to hell. To hell? After only going seven miles deep? To get to the centre of the earth, isn't it just under 4,000 miles deep? So a rumour goes, and it goes worldwide. Probably Howard Campin stuff, did it? The story was reproduced by several American tabloids. It stated that nine miles down into the Earth's crust, the scientists reached a pocket of air with a temperature of 2,000 degrees. Um, intrigued, they sent down a heat-tolerant microphone. The microphone picked up screams of the damned. Can you believe it? You've heard it before. A load of old rubbish. Listen, hell's down there, I'm telling you now. But it ain't what they say it is. So, we talk about depth. How deep? We know what is at the centre of the earth because we're Bible-believing Christians. Scientists don't. <laughs> Yet we're the ones that are faster than foolish people. And um, we know because somebody has been down there and come back up again and told us about it. Who was it? We know what's down there. We know who's crossed the gulf. Oh, you're very, very quiet tonight. Just because it's going on to take the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. So, getting back to this, Ecclesiastes 7, verse 24. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? Who can find it out? The scientists? No. Nobody knows what's at the centre of the earth. So, what about when we go far? We're, you know, 
talk about solar systems and galaxies, you know, we only know a little peripheral. We're, you know, we're going, sending our Hubble telescopes up or whatever, building the biggest telescope there are now so we can see a lot further. We've sent stuff up and we're um, taking samples of the moon, so they say. We don't know. God is, we talk awesome, God is awesome. He knows the beginning, the end, start, finish. He knows everything. He's created everything by speaking the word. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? You know, we know nothing. Do we? Know very little as mankind, yet we set ourselves up as little little dictators, you know, having the bill and end all of all knowledge. Set up our little universities. You know what we've done? I read this and I thought this was very good. We have spent, not millions toy, billions. We have spent billions, not us, but the taxpayer all over the world, has spent billions in getting man into space. Billions. You know, with the money that we have used on that to get man into space, we could have fed the world. We could feed the world over and over and over again. Everybody could have enough food, no starvation. Wipe starvation out on the money that we have spent in getting man up into orbit. And you know by getting man up into orbit how we have benefited? Hardly at all. As it stopped sin, as it stopped wickedness, as it stopped terrorists, as it stopped, um, as it cured fatal diseases, as it, I mean what good has it done? You tell me, by putting man into orbit and spending all those billions, what good it has done mankind. How deep? That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? Go as far as you can. Go as deep as you can. Man knows very little. And what he has found out hasn't stopped the wickedness. It hasn't cured any of the major problems this world faces. Starvation, war, crime, disease or death. Do you live a lot longer now because we've been into space? No, sir. Are you in better health now because we've gone into space and spent all those billions? No, sir. You've had jabs to cure things. You've got chemicals in your body that are starting things up. Things are lying dormant, maybe triggered off. We've got more disease today than we've had ever. Yeah, we may have cured a couple of diseases, but there's, there's hundreds and hundreds more. We're in no better shape, really. Materially, you know, material speaking, um, materialistically speaking, maybe, yeah, some of us, but not all of us, of course. Third world countries, people who haven't got anything to eat or drink or clean water and that. Yeah, we live like, like kings, you've got carpet and central eating and roofs and cars and money. Putting man into space, what good's it done? Spending all those billions. But deep, you talk about the deep things of God, we don't even know what's in the centre of the earth, mankind, from a worldly point of view. We speculate, we conjecture, you know, make those conjectures. But we don't know, as, as the human race, the bible even Christian knows, we, knows what, we know what is down there. But man is not clever. Imagine Hawking or Dawkins telling you what's in the centre of the earth. He ain't got a clue. They make out, they pretend, they speak with authority, you know. Some, somebody I read somewhere recently, you know, people think that by speaking with authority, you know, you shout and you speak with authority. That's not speaking with authority. Just because you shout or you raise your voice. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? The answer to the question is nobody. God knows. A Bible-believing Christian who studies this book knows. But scientists certainly don't. Verse 25. I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly even of foolishness and madness. Folly means, well if we turn back to Ecclesiastes 2.1 which we've covered previously, Ecclesiastes 2.1 we said that folly is connected with dying and going to hell. That's very interesting. Proverbs 5.23 that is. It is also connected with deceit. Proverbs 14, verse 8. And 2 Timothy 3, verse 13. And regarding folly, look up also Proverbs 15, verse 21, and Proverbs 26, 
verse 11. Folly is weakness of intellect, the want of understanding. It can be an absurd act which is highly sinful, or it can be an absurd act which is not highly criminal. It can mean depravity of the mind. So it says, I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. Somebody has written this and I thought this was very good. Listen carefully. Heaven is the place for understanding. Earth is the place for trust. I thought that's very good. You'll know what you should know when you get to heaven. Until then, you trust God for everything. Heaven, heaven is the place for understanding. And earth is the place for trust. Man attempts to use his reason to solve problems, but that doesn't amount to anything. Using his own intellect, his own wisdom, his own reason. I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. From a worldly point of view, he couldn't understand. We don't even know what's in the centre of the earth. <laughs> this great ball that we're living on. I applied my heart, Solomon says, to know and to search. Yet if you... Searching without God, you'll never find the true answers. If you're searching for the truth without God, without the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll never find out the truth. And the trouble is, the majority of people today that are in research and searching, they are researching and searching without God. I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly even of foolishness and madness. A person that understands all about the issues of life is a Bible-believing Christian. I say he doesn't understand everything, of course not. But he understands what life's about. The three big questions, where you've come from, where you're going to, and a purpose for living, a Bible-believing Christian understands that. We know things that NASA and the scientific world don't know because of this book. An authorised version, 1611, out of date <laughs> book. But this is the most up to date book that we have on the planet. And the reason why the world is in such a mess today is because they have rejected the Word of God. That's why it's in a mess. That's why the systems are breaking down. That's why kids are more rebellious than ever before. That's why we've got more disease, more sin, more wickedness, more starvation. They rejected the book. God blesses the book and those that read it and study it and learn it. And God wants to work through your lives. We've talked about that in the last few weeks. God wants to work through our lives to reach the world. So we break forth the word of God, the word of life. We break forth to a hungry world. And that world has the choice of taking the bread of life and quashing their hunger, their thirstiness, but it rejects the Lord, sadly to say. The people you rub shoulders with every day, most of them are Bible rejectors and Christ rejectors. They want nothing to do with the Lord. They talk about science as if it's a fact and evolution as a fact or what they pick up and they've um, you know, been living off the television and the media and somebody says something, you know, they found something on so and so planet and they think there's water here and if there's water there's life here therefore all they're trying to do, they're spending billions and billions to try and prove that there is no God. That's why they're doing it. They have an ulterior motive. It's not for the well-being of mankind. It's to try and prove that there is no creator which they'll never do, of course. Because we serve and love and worship the Creator God. So finishing off, we're going to pick up from verse 26 next week. I applied my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, 
even of foolishness and madness. Without God, everything is foolishness and madness. The answers are in this book, folks. All we've got to do is read it, believe it, never correct it. Let this book correct us. And live for Jesus Christ in everything, giving him the preeminent position in our lives. Worship him, reach the lost, and await the rapture. Let's pray.